Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the Welcome and Housekeeping presentation, Jesus welcomes the participants to the Assistance Group and outlines the general plan for the program, along with providing some general principles for participants to follow. Recorded on the 19th of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. The first thing is that we would like to welcome you to the start of the uh, Education in Love Assistance Groups. So hopefully you enjoy the whole process. <clears throat> now you'll notice that Mary is not here and she's not going to be here for the entire first group. Uh, and when I say first group I'm talking about both groups, there's actually two first groups. There'll be one this week and one uh, week and a half's time and uh, she won't be here for both of those. She's working on her own emotional things but she's said to, she, wants, she wanted me to say to you, uh, welcome, and also that she misses being here, and uh, she realises that some of you might have come to speak with her and so forth, so unfortunately she's not going to be able to do that. That also means, of course, that uh, you've got me, unfortunately, <laughs> for the entire time, and, which means I have to talk for 30 hours, um, over the next eight days with you and obviously that's going to be a bit difficult so um, mostly most of the time I've talked you know 10 hours at a time or whatever um, but it's been I've never done a 30 hour stint in eight days so that means that I'm going to have to look after myself which also means that you're not going to get to spend very much personal time with me during these eight days what happens here is your opportunity. Now in some ways that's good because it means that what happens here is your opportunity. <laughs> the opportunity you need to take to engage and what I would love for you to do is to engage and in fact I want to encourage you all to engage properly rather than avoid avoid the process of engagement of this pro of, the, of the material. Now for that reason we've also not produced any PowerPoint presentations because what we've found last time is that too many people were just watching and taking notes from the PowerPoint presentations rather than engaging and what we would like you to do is engage. Now the notes are on the outlines already on the internet and many of you have already downloaded them I know so they're your notes. Aside from that what I would encourage you to do is to make your own notes specific to your own issues. Does that make sense? and fully engage things openly. Now that means that many of you need to stop being shy right, and let yourself express yourself properly. Take the opportunity to express yourself. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. So will you do that? Yes. Yep, I hope so. William? Let's, uh, let's have the microphones. Uh, who's got the microphone for this side? I've got the microphone from the side. Um, while I've got the microphone, I should just say, remember to speak up close to the microphone, right, when you're holding it. We, we don't want to have issues with feedback or sound issues when, with the recording, so if you can hold the microphone up nice and close when you're asking your questions and so forth, just be conscious of that. And if... if um, see the man there? I can't see him, but... Corny, if Corny can't see you, that means he can't film you. Now, if you can't see him well and, you can't, and he can't see you well, I would ask that you stand to ask your question. Can you remember to do that for us? So there's a little line, in fact, between Lena and it goes up through, yep, through there. There's about five or six people in that line. You're going to have probably the issue of standing and if you can just bear that in mind so that Corny can at least get a shot of you. The reason why we're wanting to do this is we, we've got, you can see we've got cameras everywhere. 
Um, there's six cameras around the place. The reason why is we're, we're wanting to actually put all of this in material, material on the internet, of course, and so we want to have a complete shot of everything like we normally do. So if you can remember to do that, that'd be fantastic. William, you were going to ask. <coughs> so I just wanted to um, ask for some personal feedback just to get the ball rolling so I'm not what you know. No. We're not. No, there's a there's a time for personal feedback, mm -hmm. uh, which will be um, there's two personal feedback sessions and two group feedback sessions, and um, uh, aside from that, I do not want to engage personal feedback in the actual sessions. So I'm going to be quite tired on that. The reason why is we've got a lot of material to present, and and there's a lot of very good material. And unfortunately, what happens a lot is that many of you ask questions about material I'm going to present anyway. So, so in the end, we're better off presenting the material and then ask, asking questions. Now, there is, on e almost every single presentation, there is a Q&A section on almost every presentation. So, so tomorrow, for example, we've got a session on, on you know, what, what, are, what's your re what do you feel about love? In the second part of that session, there's a Q&A about what you feel about love. Express what you feel about love then. And, and we can talk about that. Does that make sense? The next uh, session tomorrow is what do you feel about change? And then we've got a Q&A on what you feel about change. What, what I'd like you to do is to express yourself about how you feel about change. And we can discuss the, your personal emotions in those sessions as well. So besides the personal feedback, we've also got a Q&A almost on every single presentation. And that's your time to ask the questions associated with that particular material. Does that make sense? So if you can do that, then that means that everybody will be able to be engaged, and it also means that the material is encapsulated for, for everybody's consumption, and everybody can still stay on track with regard to the material, which is our goal. Does that make sense? Yep. Sound thanks, all right? for, thanks for that. Yep, it's good. So that <coughs> that's what we want to do. All right. Um, now, Mary's given me um, a long list of things that she wanted to mention to you um, about just logistics and things like that, which I need notes to actually uh, remember. So I'm going to go through some of these things. Firstly, we'd like to say to you that this is your opportunity to gain an education about love. But, but one of the things that I must stress to you tonight, and also I'm going to stress to you tomorrow, is it is there's two people important in your future development and can you tell me who those two people are so eloisa if we if who's handling the mic on this side is there anybody yet can we have somebody yeah can do william yeah um god and me god and you now me. yes you, in terms of the two yous. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the other half of you includes you, yeah. of course. So, so, now God is doing everything already to make sure that you progress. Already God's doing everything for your progression. There's not a single thing God can do more to help you progress. So what does that say about the second half of the equation? <laughs> The second half of the equation is not going so well. <laughs> Isn't that right? And we need, to, we need to talk about that. So this is your opportunity to get the second half of that equation going, to, to actually work on your own desire and will to grow in love. And the whole series of talks that we're going to be giving, is, uh, in total is 180 hours of material. So it's like, you could think of it like a semester of material if you were going to a uni full time or something like that. And, and, it's, and basically that's what we want to make this. This is a class for you to learn more about love. It's to, to begin, hopefully, your education in love. Now, we've presented a lot of information, as you know, and, but many of you uh, still have this ability to disassociate your personal life from the information that's presented to you. In other words, you think it applies to everyone else but you. Uh, and we want to get you out of that habit as well. We want to help you start to see the, that it's all, uh, all of the information does apply to you. And this is something we'd like to address. 
So you have an opportunity here to engage this process, but you have an opportunity to meet each other. And instead of talking about the weather and how nice it is in Noosa and isn't it lovely, you've got a lovely venue and all those things, you have an opportunity to ask each other about your lives, where you come from, what you do, get to know each other. You have this lots of opportunity. You have eight days potentially together where you've got hours and hours of time that you're not here and you've got plenty of time to engage and get to know people and ask them really sincere questions about their life and their goals and their desires and get to know them. And each of you have an opportunity to no longer present your facade to each other. You have that opportunity. So there's a lot of opportunities here that you can engage. We'd encourage you to engage them. All right? Okay, so now let's look at some logistical issues. Um, how many of you are staying here? Just as an idea. So the majority are staying here. Okay. It, please take care of the venue. Um, the venue has been very good to us. Um, they, al they allowed us to make a booking without knowing how many people would be coming. They allowed us to just pay, and, and we'll go through some of what happened to ha make this venue happen in a minute, but they allowed us to pay for the venue in advance and without even knowing how many people would be booking or not, any of those kind of things. And they, most venues want all of the uh, guarantees and they, they haven't asked us for any guarantees at all. So the venue's been very good to us and, and we would like you to be very good to the venue. <laughs> so please treat the venue with love and treat the people who are behind the desks you know, with love. They, they will have a taste of God's way through your behaviour. So if your behaviour is not very good, then of course that's the taste that they will get. So we'd encourage you to care for the venue. The other thing we'd like to do, tell you to do is to care for the recording. Remember there's, there's three and a half, well there's now 3,800 people or so around about who listen to these presentations. Every, every one of them. And so what we would like you to do is to, is to bear in mind that there's that many people who will eventually watch the recording. So every time you take your microphone away and, you, and they can't hear you, that's 3,000 people can't hear you. Right? Does that sound daunting? You'd rather 3,000 people not hear you. Right? Well, that might be an issue in itself. But we would like to have all of those 3,000 people be able to learn and later there might be 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 people who, who learn from these presentations and we would like them to hear you. Does that make sense? That we would also like them to see you as well. And I know that some of you don't feel very comfortable with that, but that's a part of the problems you have with regard to truth. You, you're not willing to just be openly truthful no matter how many people are watching you. And we'd like to address that. So what we would like to have happen is you take care of the recording. We're, we're doing live editing, as you can see. If you look at Igor's situation there, you'll, you'll see he's actually got two screens in front of him. He's got six camera feeds on one screen, and he switches between those camera feeds. And every time you put up your hand, so let's say, let's, let's do this. We get, uh, let's say... Um, Paige, can you put up your hand as if you're going to ask questions? So Corny's going to you. Igor is going to switch across to that, right? So he switches across to that view. No, half of you can't see that. <laughs> but, but he's got to do all of that while it's happening. Right, so don't talk to Igor. <laughs> At least while he's doing that, he's got enough to do. He's also going to manage the sound desk next to him, which we think we've sorted out pretty well anyway. So he's got the sound desk to manage, he's got six camera feeds to manage, as well as make sure that everything's recording and so forth. So there's a whole procedure that I've got to go through. So if you can be mindful of that, what we're doing is we're having a loo break, a toilet break, every hour. So there should be very little need for anybody here to get up other than those times. If there is, can you take particular note of the two main cameras and where Corny's camera is pointing? Because if you get up and walk in front of them, then of course they've lost the view. So if you can just be mindful of those things. Obviously, the other thing is that if you're talking with each other during the 
presentations and obviously that's going to interrupt our presentation and also if you've got your mobile phone on and uh, you have to get a call or whatever that's going to interrupt our presentation so we would like you to either not bring them or if you're going to bring them to record please have them in, si in airplane mode so that it turns off the Wi-Fi, turns off the connection and it's just here recording like a recording device would be. That's what we would like for you to do. Okay, is there anything else you can think of there that there's nothing much else I can think of there? If you use the mics, remember, use them properly. It's very critical. Jennifer, thanks. So, thanks, everyone. When it comes to toilet break, where are the toilets? If uh, we've actually closed, they're actually through there, but we've closed that door off. You have to actually go out and around, around the side of the cafe and then in the side, uh, there's a side uh, door into the toilets. Does that make sense? We've done it that way so that we can get the seating in because we, we have to fit 70 people's seats in and that meant closing up uh, five or six areas there where we had to close it up to, to stop people from walking through. So, so that's why we've done it that way. Yep. But they're just out, around, down and then in. Not very far. You, you certainly won't bust by the time you get there. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing we do need is we do need some volunteers for our microphones on rotation. So what we're going to do is ask before every session, we're going to ask if we can have two volunteers just to handle the microphones for that session. Now, one volunteer will handle one side and one volunteer will handle the other. And the reason why that is, is we don't want you walking in front of the camera. Does that make sense? So if one can handle one side, one can handle the other. And we'd like this never to have the same volunteer twice. So that's going to mean there's, there's 30 sessions, two volunteers, there's that 60 people. So almost all of you will be on the microphone at least once. That's what we're hoping. Right? So if you haven't put your hand up to volunteer for a microphone at one point, get it over and done with fast. <laughs> And then you don't have to do it for the rest of the group. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we just do not have enough people with us who have seen the material who, um, who could also handle our microphones. So that's the issue that we have there. Now, with regard to care for the presenters, and by the way, I am the only presenter, so you're going to look after me, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So one way you look after me is don't, don't have personal conversations with me out of the time that I'm talking, particularly during the sessions. Now, I don't mind it on my day off or something like that, but, but during the sessions, I've already talking for five hours straight. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried talking for five hours straight, but um, trust me, after five hours, you don't really feel like talking. <laughs> and, and so I'm not going to really feel like talking after that time. And also, um, I'm also working through some emotions at the moment where this part of my jaw is locking up on me frequently and because uh, there's grief there that I've got to feel and I'm not and uh, so that's making my life a bit more difficult with talking and so it's going to be important that I look after myself with regard to that. Now we know you have a lot of questions and you've got plenty of opportunities in your Q&A sessions to ask them. My suggestion is ask them. Right? and make sure they're focused on the subject, on the topic, but ask them and, and engage the process. Now, at the conclusion of the each day, uh, I think we're finishing, um, there's a schedule at the back, but I think it's about 20 past four or something like that on the first day. And oh, oh, by the way, I should explain to you the way the days are organised. We have, a, a session is two days. So there's a two day session starting tomorrow, and then we have a day's break, and a two-day session and a day's break and another two-day session. Does that make sense? So there's three two-day sessions. In the first two-day session, on the first day of every two-day session, we start at 10.30 in the morning and we finish, I think it's about 4.20 or something like that in the afternoon, right? It's a five-hour session, right? We, in between that time, we have 10-minute uh, minute breaks for toilet breaks in between and we have a 20 minute break in the middle of the day should you wish to get a quick bite to eat or something like that have a bit of fruit or whatever 
and have a bit more of a rest. But we have to do some processing things. That's why we've allowed for a 20-minute break during that period. And at the end of the day, myself and Igor have quite a lot of work to do. We have to do around about an hour's work to tidy up the day so that we're ready for the next day. For that reason, what we would like is that, that you all exit, exit <laughs> from the group uh, when it's finished as soon as possible. Does that make sense? Because that means that we can then close down everything, get all the disks out, we have to copy a whole heap of material, then we make, f we make a duplicate of the material, then two backups of the material every single day. And every single day there's 1.2 terabytes of material. So it's a large amount of material that we're recording and we need to get it processed every day. If we don't do it every day, then we've got two days to do the next day. And, and after a while, if, if we allowed it two days, we wouldn't even get it done overnight. And, and then we have a problem in keeping up with the material. So it's very important we keep up with our material so that we can get our material out to the internet. And for that reason, we need your help to make sure that at the end of the session, pack up your gear, Get yourself, if you want to stay and talk, there's plenty of opportunities outside to sit down and talk with friends and so forth. And so do that if you want to. But if we can have you out of the auditorium, that would be fantastic. Is that okay with you? Good. All right, now the next thing I want to talk about is care for each other. We notice uh, sometimes that, that people don't care for each other very well, even though they're coming to be educated about love. And it's quite amusing if you think about it, or ironic probably would be a better word. So what we would like you to do is to think about caring for each other. What, what would you do if you were caring for another person? You would do for them what you would like them to have done for you, which is what? The golden rule? You remember that? Yeah, I remember it. And uh, I suppose I should, considering I said it. Um, <laughs> So we would like to make sure that, that you apply that golden rule in, in your sessions, with it, you know, in your interactions with each other. Now, any person that we notice who's being unloving to others, we are going to remove and we are not going to have you back. Because we feel that if you can't be loving to everybody who's here, then, then it's highly unlikely you're dedicated to learning about love. So, so we would like you to think about that. If you're worried about that, then, we, then I'd suggest to you, maybe you're not that committed to learning about love if you're worried about how you're going to treat other people. My suggestion is treat them with love and respect just like you would like to be treated, and then you'll be fine. Yeah. So, but don't assume that yelling and screaming at somebody is how you would like to be... If that's how you would like to be treated, I'd think, hmm, there's something wrong there, perhaps. And perhaps that comes to do with your family background, but the reality is we're not going to tolerate that here. We're also not going to tolerate you being unloving to me, because there's ways you can be unloving to me. Many of you do it, and, and I've, I might be talking for four hours, and then you come up because you've just got to ask your question, thinking that your question is unique and you didn't get to cover it in the Q&A session, and so you come up and you want me to engage you, that's not being loving to me. I've just spoken for four hours and I shouldn't have to have uh, another 10 minute discussion. I need a rest before my fifth hour. Does that make sense? So I, I need to be able to have trust that you guys are able to treat the presenters, and, and even if it's not me, if it's Mary or someone else, with love and respect. All right. Now, we like being with you. That's why we don't have a stage in everything. All right. But the problem for that is that you all believe at some point that that means that we're totally accessible to you all of the time without any consideration of our personal welfare. And that's something that we feel needs to change. All right. Okay, now families with children. How many of you, how many of you got children here? Um, so only a few. We've already talked to both of you, so we don't need to mention any of those things. Just one thing for, you, for your kids. There are dangerous places on this resort, obviously. You've got the bouncing mat and the, you know, you get some idiot like AJ on the bouncing mat <laughs> and your kids might get hurt. So you've just got to be careful about that. And, uh, and just to be bear in mind to know where they are 
at all times. Yep. And I know both of you have taken care of that, so that's good. Okay, now program format we've talked about. Everyone's happy with the format of the program? Yep. We've tried to make it not too intense so that you've got time to feel and time to think and time to question and so forth. But um, we've made, tried to make it in such material that you're, you're able to engage it and, uh, and go away with a lot of information that you can apply personally in your day-to-day -day life. So um, I think I've mentioned most of the program format issues, so that's fine. I've mentioned the toilet break, so that's fine. Meal times, well, it's up to you. You, you know, you're a grown-up adult, aren't you? <laughs> Not quite yet. Um, I'm sure you know when to eat, though. And so do whatever you want there with regard to your meals. Um, it's up to you. And by the way, there are, within about uh, one and a half kilometres, there's heaps of restaurants. There's also the local, there's two Woolworths within two kilometres from, of this venue, actually. One in Noosa and one in Tawantan. And uh, so there's plenty of places where you can go to get food if you need food. And, uh, and, and mo a lot of them have vegan options if you're, if you're vegan. So... That's, that's really good. I think you, if you have a problem with food, you probably haven't prepared very well. Now, I just need to go through the personal feedback sessions. Um, there's only going to be two of them. Um, one will be uh, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, Sunday afternoon, and the other one will be Wednesday afternoon. I think that's right, Thursday. No, Thursday afternoon. Um, Thursday's day off? Must be Wednesday afternoon. It is Wednesday afternoon. I was right the first time. Um, the rest of the times are Q&A, so you have the ability to interact. But, but we, in the personal feedback sessions, we will actually be having people up the front, like we did in the group that you saw in, to, in 2014. And we would like the people who we do choose to be up here five minutes before start because we need to just show them a few things to be mindful of. And, uh, and we need to get a few cameras changed in terms of positioning. If you're not here at the five minutes before the start, if you're chosen to do a personal feedback session, then we'll just go to the next person and try and find them. Is that okay with you? We just need you here well in advance because we need to every keep everything on time. Now, up the back, uh, Cornelius is going to look after these. You'll see some red folders or pinkish folders on the left-hand side up the back. There's, um, yeah, thanks, Eloise, if we just grab one so you can have a look. The first one is to do with the feedback session on um, Sunday afternoon, and the second one is to do the feedback session on Wednesday afternoon. If, if you want to have some feedback, we would like you to focus on getting feedback on the subjects we've discussed up until that session. So tomorrow there's a session about how you feel about love and there's a session about how you feel about change and then on Sunday there's a session about um, why you resist change and love. And now any topic related to that, I'm happy to have in the feedback session, but it has to be related to that. Does that make sense? And then we'll engage it as a part of the feedback. So if you want to be involved with that, put your name down, write down your topic of what it is that you would like to ask about. And remember, you'll be up the front. Now, these sessions can be very powerful for other people and yourselves. So, so they're good opportunities. Um, but obviously, it requires a bit of bravery to do it as well, discussing your personal issues in the front of 70 people. So obviously, it's going to require a bit of openness and desire for truth in amongst that process and a willingness to feel. And so my suggestion is only put your name down if you're willing to do those things. All right. um, with regard to those sessions, Anybody who gets angry with me will be booted out the door. <laughs> so I'm not going to tolerate any anger with me in those sessions. And if there's resistance, I'm just going to terminate the session. So if I find the person's resistive emotionally, I just say, you're resistive emotionally, please sit down, we'll grab someone else. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, because we don't want to waste time barging through your resistance. 
if a person's open, then it's great. We can have a free, free flowing conversation, which is really our goal. Um, you already saw that Fab and Kate have did some music outside. There is a program for that. Now, the venue has asked, uh, there's a little list here called Expressions of Interest in the Cafe Area Acoustic Music Afternoons. It sounds convoluted. But basically, there's three afternoons, um, sorry, there's two more afternoons in this group, Monday and Thursday, which are your days off. There's from 3 to 6 p.m., uh, some music sessions, right? Now, the venue would like to know who would like to come to those sessions they ha because they have the cafe open and they want to know so that they, if you are interested in ordering some food in particular, they want to know so that they can prepare a bit rather than having no idea what, what they've got to do with regard to food. So that list is going to be up the back. Some of you have already put your name on it and ticked off. That's fine. You don't need to do it again. Those of you who have not, if you can grab that list later as you go out and just write down your name if you're going to be at one of those times and tick it off so that when the venue looks at this, they can go, right, we need to prepare for 40 people being there that night or 20 people being here that night and so forth. Does that make sense? Other than that, Monday and Tuesday, there is no breakfast at the cafe. They have Mondays and Tuesdays off um, in the mornings, so no breakfast in the cafe, so you'll have to make your own breakfast. Oh, isn't that terrible? <laughs> and, and Friday and Saturday, they do have cafe in the evenings, Friday and Saturday evenings anyway. So on Friday and Saturday evenings, after we've finished here, the cafe will be open on both of those evenings. Okay, so that's that. Water is up the back. You'll notice there's a bottle up there. So fill up if you need it. We've got plenty of water. And uh, I think drink a lot if you can. You, you've got the opportunity to go to the toilet every hour. So, so you don't have to sort of time it, right? You know? mm -hmm. um, so y you, you'll be able to drink um, a fair bit during the day. My suggestion is drink plenty of water. It will help you during our sessions. All right, so that's most of our logistics. I don't know if any of you have any more questions that you want to ask about, Lily? If uh, Mike's behind, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering with the Monday and Thursday afternoon pizza music thing, when do we have to say bye? Um, they would probably like to know well in advance. Is, well, tonight would be great if possible. Okay. And the main reason is because they've got to order food and so forth. So, um, yeah, they'd probably like to know. But uh, if you know you're going to go a day or two in advance, my suggestion is go over to the front desk and just say, could, you put, could I put my name on that list? Yep, on that cafe list. Okay, thanks. Yep. If you can't, let them know before then. Anything else? Rita, thanks. She's next. <coughs> I want to say something technical. In my view, the flight mode doesn't switch off the Wi-Fi. You can have flight mode on and Wi-Fi still, at least on my phone. Right, sure yeah, if you can switch off your Wi-Fi. As well. As well. Yep, thank you. Yep. We find it interferes with these roaming microphones, and so it interferes with our sound. Mia, thanks. Um, will we have the opportunity to give hard drives in for uh, update? Oh yes, some, something I should have mentioned. Give them to me any time you want. Um, I'll usually have them done by the next day. Okay? Thanks. So, so bring, bring them along. And, and mind you, if all of you bring them along tonight, I won't have them <laughs> done by the next day. But uh, yeah, but feel free to bring hard drives to get copied. We're now up to one point, to just over one terabyte of data. So that means that if you have less than one terabyte, you're gonna have to buy a new hard drive first. <laughs> um, yeah, because we're just, we're, we're adding around about 40 gigs at the moment every month now. So um, you know, it's, going, it's going to add up eventually, obviously. Yeah, uh, do a lot of you ha have hard drives to update? Just if you yeah, not many, so that's fine. Yep. Anything else you'd like to ask? Okay. Well, okay, we've got 25 minutes. <laughs> 25 minutes to burn, unless you want to go now. <laughs> right. 
Hey, Alan, up to back. You may have already asked this. I just wanted to know how you're feeling, how you're going. Yeah, um, I'm going pretty good, Al. Like, I'm a bit blocked with some things at the moment, but uh, um, I'm going through some... Well, it's difficult to explain the emotions because they're all related to reincarnation process, but um, I, I'm going through some emotions that, uh, that none of you will have to go through, but, uh, and, and for that reason it's probably pointless trying to explain them, but, but they are quite tough on me physically, um, so, so I'm finding I've, I feel pretty fit and healthy, but um, I'm having a lot of joint pain and a lot of problems around my throat uh, with grief and a few things like that. But I still don't know what I've got to cry about, so <laughs> and, and I still can't connect to it uh, emotionally, so, so, so that's blocking me up. But aside from that, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, myself and Mary, I've had to... Uh, Ma Mary's gone through a process recently of recognising that, that she was still in a lot of addiction in terms of what she wanted to avoid. And so that's the reason why she's not, not here. She wants to work her way through those particular things. And, uh, and that's meant myself and Mary are not, we're not living together at this stage so that she can address some of those, some of those addictions. Some of them had to, be, had to be do with what she wanted from me. And, uh, and so I've said, no, you can't <laughs> have those particular things. And she, she's uh, now working through those particular emotions, uh, mostly, again, to do with things that you guys will not have to address. It's to do with who she is and her identity and, and other issues like that, uh, which are tough emotions for all of the 14 to address. That's why none of them have addressed it yet, <laughs> aside from myself. And um, so, yeah, but, but we're, you know, we're going pretty good, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm enjoying... I'm enjoying myself, and uh, and I, I'm finding now that a lot of my emotions are like I need a lot of time to just feel to actually access them. Does that make sense? So, so what I'm trying to do is back off the busy because we've been really busy, and I've tried to back off the busy and have you know a good solid four hours a day where I've got four hours with no one else around. Yeah, so, and what was happening up to a few months ago was that Mary was projecting at me still that she wanted me to make her feel safe and wanted her, wanted her to feel, make, make her, me to make her feel secure. And, and, um, and, I, and I've worked through some emotions now where I don't want to do that anymore. And so that's meant that she's had to come face to face with the things that she's not feeling safe about. Yeah. So, in the, in the first century, she had a pretty difficult life, as you might imagine. And, uh, and so, she's having come face to face with quite a few quite big emotions at the moment. Um, and that's why she needed the time which she's decided to take, yeah. I was just wondering, um, I've personally know, known you guys for about five and a half, six years. Yep. And I've really noticed... Mary's growth in the last th three years, yep. and her mediumship's just gone to a, a beautiful level. Yep. Does that, for her, as you said before, it's different to what you guys are going through than what we're going to go through, but does that bring up the fear more that she's closer to God to be able to talk to the celestials? Does her fear increase because it's triggering these things you just mentioned in her? Her fear was triggered the day I met her seven or eight eight years ago and and by her own admission she hasn't addressed that fear um the fear is about you know who she is it's to do with psychologically it's very difficult to you know it, you know a lot of people say things like this is how you know someone's not one of the 14 they want to be one of the 14 that's how you know they're not because <laughs> no none of the 14 want to be one of the 14 right so so you know, the majority of people that, you know, say they're one of the 14 obviously want to be, and they're definitely not, 
and uh, and because they have no idea of the psychological distress that that the contemplation of even the question causes and um, and then there's all the memories because you've got all of your first century life to remember plus all of your spirit life to remember um, which in itself is very traumatic because it bears no resemblance to any life you've had on earth from on this life so that's very very traumatic to go through and Mary has, a, has, a, has tried to address some of those things but not emotionally processed through her terror about those particular things and she's been terrified that entire time and you can see the terror in her face, like it's in a, her eyes. Were, my eyes used to be black, like when I was in my, well, I was about 30, I had, my eyes were black. People thought that I'd been punched, <laughs> they were black. And, uh, and in fact, doctors used to tell me that I need to go and get, you know, my kidneys examined because my eyes were black. And, and you notice that Mary has the same blackness around her eyes as well. It's the same, same thing that I had. Mine eventually disappeared over m years of crying and, and processing through terror. And, um, and Mary has not done that yet. She's relied on me to help her avoid her terror. And, um, and that's why she's addressing the issue. Like she knows she has to address this issue now. Yeah, but that being said, she has addressed a lot of her addictions, m most of her addictions actually. That's why she's left in this state now, where she's a completely aware of what they are. Um, wh whereas, like the majority of people uh, that I know, have yet to even touch addressing their addictions, and she's letting go of the facade, and that's helped her a lot as well. So she's done a lot of progress in those two areas. And, uh, but in terms of receiving God's love and receiving my love, she's very blocked uh, by her own admission. Yeah. And in regards to giving love, she's very blocked as well. So, so she, she's working her way through those particular issues. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. She'll talk to you about them when she's worked her way through some of them. Yeah. And... Uh, there's not, there's not a single woman on this planet who's worked through terror. Not, not a single one. So if you're a woman who thinks you have, you haven't. Yeah. Eva. Yeah, I was um, going to ask if uh, Mary's working through her terror will help yes. us. Yes, it'll help you greatly. Yep. And... Uh, like this is why I've been encouraging her to do it for such a long time is that it will help a lot of other women to see so, so most women either get really really angry when they're faced with their terror or they they get in this very very um, rigid rigid state when they're faced with terror and and the majority well every woman I've, I've ever met to be frank I, I don't know a single woman in this audience who've dealt with terror so, so my suggestion is that you know each of you ladies will have to address terror at some point, just like each of the guys will. You know, it, it, terror is in the human race. If it wasn't in the human race, then then we wouldn't be acting like we're acting, right? But uh, but dealing with terror is a very difficult is very difficult for women more than men, and the main reason why is because women are better at fragmenting their lives than men are. Do you understand? No? No, please explain a little. Women are better than fra at fragmenting their lives than men are. Right? The reason why is that, is that there's been a lot more pressure from society for women to live in facade than there has been for men to live in facade. Does that make sense? Surely you ladies can feel that. Yeah. Now this is why you know you have like men don't wear makeup, generally. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not always true nowadays. I suppose I <laughs> might have to correct that. But but the the main reason for that is that men have not societally been demand it, it be demanded of them to make themselves look pretty or beautiful, but it has been demanded of women, right? And it's been demanded of women for thousands of years. It's not like it's a, 
It's a problem in this, in this world today. It's at thousands of views. If you think of how many so-called beauty magazines there are, there's a few men's magazines, but a lot of them mostly have women in them, unfortunately. But women's magazines are just full of how to make yourself slimmer, prettier, be more beautiful, look younger, and so forth and so forth, isn't it? There's just a huge amount of pressure on you ladies to live in your facade, right? And, and that facade, uh, to, to break down that facade, many of you are terrified to even break down that facade. Because not so much of the judgment of men, but of other women. And what they will say about you, think about you, do with you, treat you, and so forth. So there's a lot of pressure on women to, to not give up their facade. And as a result of that, women are better, have been trained to be better at, at separating their inner life from their outer life. And you ladies know what I'm talking about there. Because you often do that. You do that sexually and emotionally. Right? And this is what, this is what happens. You separate your, se your, sex your sexual and emotional life, your inner sexual and emotional life from your outer sexual and emotional life, for example. And, and the two are not the same thing. Right? And, it, and it's a lot more pressure on you to maintain that than there is for men to maintain that. Like, men don't have to be pure and good before they're married. In fact, it's, it's okay for a man, generally, in this society to have played around a bit because he gets a bit of experience, right? Uh, but if a woman does that, how, how is she treated? Completely different, right? There's a, there's a lot of very... Like, what you would classify today as normal treatment of women is not normal or loving, right? But it also creates inside of yourselves uh, an, a, a, a training to be, to, to be fragmented internally. And, and giving up the fragmentation is very, very difficult. Something that needs to be done. And this is why you see most women are very much concerned more about appearances, for example, than men. Very much more concerned about how things look to the world, in my, often, of, oftentimes than men are. Yep. Not always, but these are generalities, of course. So, so there are a number of emotions that have to be addressed by women. And if we, if we go back to the discussion, which was Mar about Mary's life, and I don't like talking about Mary without her here, of course, but she, she knows me well enough, so, and I know her well enough to know what's going on. But um, you know, I'd love for her to share with you about those particular things once she's gone through them, which I'm sure she will do. But the, the issue really is that, that for her, her first century life was pretty much horrific in the majority of time. And the only time she really had any power of any kind was when she used her sexual power over, over people. And she has terrible memories of that with, with a lot of shame and guilt associated with that. To address and and also therefore have wanted to maintain a facade not not allowing herself to remember those particular things and so that creates fragmentation as soon as you have fragmentation it's very very difficult to process emotion All right so so the, the more she works her way through those particular issues the easier you ladies should find it to work your way through those same issues yeah how, how can that be? How, how does that happen? Well, at this stage, Eva, you don't know the power of the soul of one of the 14. So, so but, but you, if you can imagine, there's been 2,000 years of development for those particular souls. So obviously, once one of those people deal with something, it has a very large influence upon oh, any other person who has that same particular problem. Yeah. And that's going to be the case. Unfortunately, all the 14 are more frightened than you are. <laughs> so it's going to be very difficult for them to do that. And that's why they're struggling with that process. Nina, thanks. The fragmentation that you're talking about, is that why I see that I'm demanding and controlling, yet I've also been a doormat? So yeah. 
It gets really confusing because you've got both those things yeah, playing you, out in your life. There's a tendency to take on roles. So with one particular type of person, you'll take on a particular type of role. With another particular type of person, you'll take on another role. When you can feel that a person's going to put up with your crap, as the saying goes, uh, you'll deliver some crap because you, you know you're going to get away with it without them attacking you. But if a person's not going to put up with your crap and they're going to punch you in the nose, then you pander to them because that's a role that you take on with that particular person. And women are very good at that. A safety issue. A lot of it's to do with safety, yes, of course, and, and to avoid attack, to avoid, you know, being personally harmed. You see, when you think about it historically, again, men use their physical strength to, to avoid harm or, or to fight and, and reject harm. But women haven't had the ability to do that generally, so what do they use? Manipulation. Yeah, there's only, there's only a few other things you can use. You can only use manipulation, sexual manipulation. There's only a few things that work, isn't there, really? And, uh, and women have been taught to use those particular things. You follow? And, and this causes fragmentation. It means that what you start doing is you start doing one thing for one person, but you can feel the other person. You can't do that with that, them. So what you've got to do is another thing with that particular person. And you start seeing this as a normal way of living rather than going, well, what do I want? What are, how am I going to be? And I'm just going to be me. You don't do that. Well, you don't even know what that, that is initially. It's a big discovery that we... Well, you don't know what it is anymore. Right. Because basically from, the age of, from a young age, a child, you, you've been taught to give mummy and daddy what they want, otherwise this might happen to you. Give the man what he wants because this might happen to you. Give other women what they want, so this, otherwise this might happen to you. And in the end, you're running around just doing what everybody really wants and you haven't even considered what you want. In fact, in fact, for many of you, you're addicted to not considering what you want because you know that if you consider what you want and you actually do it, then probably other people are going to attack you and abuse you and harm you, and you don't want that. So, so it all gets down to, I'm afraid of getting harmed, and I'll do anything to avoid it. It doesn't have to be really, I know it for me, it doesn't even have to be a physical harm. Just no. someone not liking me is enough to... No, that's uh, enough. Yeah. yeah, For the average woman, that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of men can tolerate somebody not liking them quite easily, and a lot of women find that very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Josh? Um, just to clarify, when you said that no woman has... Um, dealt with their terror. With terror. You meant Mary as well? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the terror, she's, she... Because I gathered that she felt some terror, but was that just like what you were saying, it was rigid for her? Like it wasn't the real terror? No, she knows that it's not. And uh, she knows that she's dealt with some terrors, you know, some fears, but not the primary fears that are within her that when she addresses, you know, things will be totally different for her. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yep. Uh, up the back. Uh, Renee? Money? Monique? No, Renee. Renee? Um, just wondering, there's been a lot of... Um, oh, sorry, Corny. Um, there's been a lot of... Um, things that I've heard about people praying with um, the Christian faith and praying with God to help people and sick. I'm just wondering, can we pray to help Mary or is that... Yeah, of course. Like, like so we can pray... Do, do, what do you think God's doing already, though? Oh, thanks. God. God's already doing everything God possibly can to help everyone. That includes Mary, right? But your prayers can increase the improve the situation why 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 do your prayers improve the situation because your prayers are asking god to do to to influence other people to do even more and you're wanting to do more your your desire is added to the process you follow if your desire is added to it then obviously there's a higher likelihood of something occurring if if every woman on the planet wanted to address fear you imagine sooner or later one of you will address fear, right? Yep. So 
But what, what's a real prayer? So what, you've got to ask yourself, why do you want Mary to go through it? Could be a bit of an issue there, couldn't there? <laughs> yeah. So that you don't have to, is that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that I, could be an issue, I, right? I suppose I know like how blocked I am towards my emotions and towards fear and... and so uh, why I pray? It is a prayer really sincere if you know you personally are blocked towards something, can you see that that would also add to somebody else's blockage? So for example, if, if there were 10 women in this audience who had already addressed fear, terror, can you see the other, uh, there's, there's 50 um, women in the audience, you, you would might find it easier to address fear. Can you see that? But if there's nobody in the audience who has addressed fear, can you see how difficult it would be being the first person to do it? Because you've got all the resistances of those other people, right, to address. When you start dealing with it, what are all the other people going to feel? They're going to feel like, don't do that. You know, making us frightened now. What? We're going to have to do that? We don't want to have to do that. And then they get angry and there's all sorts of things that happen projected at the person who's doing it first. So one way that you can help greatly is by addressing your own by actually having a sincere desire to address your own do you follow i do i've got yeah. a really big block in um like faith in myself i have more faith than that other people can do it so yeah see i would call that an excuse and we're going to talk about excuses okay. um that's just an excuse yeah and and to be honest with you guys um i'm not going to tolerate most of your excuses in this se these <laughs> sessions. I've heard them all before. You, you think I've lived for 2,000 years. How many times <laughs> have I heard an excuse? <laughs> uh, like, excuses are not going to get you anywhere. There's only a one or two main reasons why we're not progressing. And I've got nothing to do with anything other than you excusing yourself from progressing. You're wanting somebody else to do it for you, in front of you, with you, instead of you, <laughs> instead of you preferably, <laughs> and so forth. Does that make sense? But your prayers certainly do help another person and so therefore would help Mary. But of course I'm praying for Mary every day and so are uh, and many, many others and there's many of our celestial friends that are also doing that as well as doing practical things to help her. So, um, but I'm not suggesting that your prayers won't help. They certainly will. But one thing that would help perhaps even more is that if you guys decided to begin addressing the same kind of emotions within yourself that she's having to address without, with, with your resistance. You follow? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, that's something, uh, that's something I've had a lot to have to do myself, obviously where I've had to address my emotions with everybody's resistance. There's not a single person who's agreed with any of my emotions that I've ever ad addressed, ever. And that includes Mary. Mary's never agreed to any of my emotions either. There's not a single person who has actually been supportive of me addressing one of my emotions. All right? So I've had to learn to forget about what other people think of me. Forget about what they, how they judge me and forget about all the things that matter to them and so forth and just do it. And in a way, Mary's going to probably need to do the same thing. But she doesn't have to, because you could all decide to do it too. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things we want to talk about during this will discussion. So, so the program over the next week, we're looking forward to delivering. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that you will enjoy the reception of it. We'll see. And it's going to be focused on the development of your will. That's our focus. So tomorrow morning, there's going to be a discussion with you that sort of sets the scene for the entire week as to what we're going to discuss with you and, and why we're discussing those particular things with you. 
So tonight, the, the intention tonight was just to go through some logistics and to welcome you and to get you used to what the program will be so that tomorrow we can get started and we don't have to worry about logistics and everything else is sorted and we can just get straight into the program. Yeah. I think, I think you can have fun with it if you decide to. But, but, you know, most of the material is obviously going to be emotionally challenging. And, uh, and this is where it needs to... It's going to depend a lot on yourself. It's going to depend a lot on yourself. And that's one of the things we'd like to emphasise to you. No, no, you're the most important person in your own progression, really. God's already doing everything God can. You're, uh, aside from God, you're the most important person. Unless you make some changes, unless you decide to do something different, you're going to continue having the same life, potentially getting worse as your life progresses, as, as all of the unloving behaviour adds up. Right? We, would, we would like to help you reverse that process, and that's why we want to give you some information about how to do that. Yeah. Now, Mary, Mary was uh, real keen to be here because a lot of this information is really dear to her heart because it's what she's just recently gone through. So that's, uh, that's why she's sort of a bit sad about not being here. But she also feels that what she's going through now is more important than, than being here. So that's why she's not here at the moment. But, uh, but she's pretty keen about the information. And you might see her through the week um, because she's probably going to, she's, she's over at home at the moment, and, uh, but she probably might pop in during the week, you never know. And, uh, and we'll get to share some things with you, hopefully through that process of her coming. But I don't know. She, it, I've left it up to her as to what she would like to do there. Is there any other questions you want to ask? No? Okay. Uh, I was just curious about finding the venue. I think you touched on you're going to maybe mention something about how you found the venue. Yeah, well, uh, Raj and Suze have used the venue before, and so they recommended the venue to us, and uh, and they came down and checked it out uh, as well because it's been some time since you used it before, wasn't it? And uh, so they did a lot of all of that initial contact work and everything. And then we took over from them and came down, checked out the venue, said, yeah, it was a good venue. I made sure it was going to be suitable for our size and so forth. But uh, then it just required a lot of talking with them, obviously, about what we could do. You see, um, the way we arrange our venues is different to almost how anybody else arranges their venues, in that we can't guarantee anything because we don't know how many people are coming or how much money we're going to be or anything. So, so, and we don't have a kitty that's there that says, right, we can just put 20 grand into this now and, and make it happen. And so what we had to do is rely on you. So, so what happened was we announced the possibility of it and in one week you guys had paid for the venue. So actually the venue came about because of you guys, really. <laughs> Because without you doing that, we would not have been able to pay for the venue and therefore hire the venue. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's how we do every venue because, because it has to be driven by the desire of the people involved. And, and we don't have a kitty to put into venues that, that we don't know how many people are coming to or anything like that. The other thing is that most of the venues want some kind of guarantee. So the, at the beginning, this, this venue would, would have wanted a guarantee of some kind, you know, like 10 people here or 20 people there or whatever. And once we worked through with them that we couldn't do those particular things for the reasons that we had, and they understood that really well, actually. And, and they just sort of trusted the process, um, which has worked out to their benefit, actually, because we've actually paid now for three complete months of hire of this venue. Yeah. So of this year, three months is completely paid for. Yeah. Raj? Um, uh, Jesus, I think it might be just appropriate to really thank those people who've 
agreed to stay at the venue. Yeah. Because it's really driven by the accommodation because this is a, a timeshare privately owned resort. Yes. So um, they're very conscious as to getting the utilization. So of, yes. by staying, we've really, you've, you've really collectively made this possible. Yeah. So you, what happened was that we chose their most off peak periods. So this week, this two, this month was there from from yesterday or whatever it was to another month is a, is the their one of the high, their lowest periods, and then we've chosen in May June the lowest period there, and and in November is their lowest period there, and that's why. So this is their lowest period. Normally they would ha it would be almost empty the entire venue. So the fact that there's I don't know how many of you six, fifty or sixty of you staying here is a, is good for them. And that's made it possible. Also, the hire of this venue, this was uh, this room, was $135 a day. Now, now, if we were in the states, this room would be around around about uh, uh, about $1,500, dollars a day. And when you're running an eight-day event, plus we've got two, three days set up, two days dismantle, so it's really a, more like a 12-day or 13-day event, and you're paying $2,000 a day. You know that's that's a lot of of money. So um, and of course uh, we also needed to pay for um, Lena and Igor's uh, accommodation and things like that. But you guys did all that, so you can thank yourselves for being generous enough to allow this to occur. But initially it was Raj and Suzanne. So they'd, they'd been here before, so that initial contact is what led us to the venue. So that that was great too, Denise. But I asked a question about the uh, all of the fourteen, mm -hmm. as if they do they all now have an inkling of who they are. Or? They all have had one at some point, but most of them now are in complete denial of that experience. So how does that affect you guys who have stepped into? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on us from them to 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 not say anything about any of us existing and so forth. Mm. Yep. Okay, thanks. They, they want to live a normal life and they have free will just like you do, so they're allowed to make that choice. That choice obviously comes with a lot of penalties because uh, penalties or consequences that are negative to themselves because they're not living as themselves. So that, that's very difficult, but uh, unfortunately that's their choice at the moment. And it doesn't mean their choice is going to be like that forever. It just means it's like that now. Yeah. And I expect it will be like that for another few years at least. Yeah. That being said, we've had some contact with recently with some of them and periodically they give me a call. <laughs> is the best way to put it. You know, they email me or give me a call. But, uh, you know, they find the con the conversation confronting emotionally and generally I don't hear from them again for another six months or 12 months or whatever it is <laughs> that they feel they can cope with another call <laughs> and uh, that's happened very fairly periodically for the last well since I met Mary before I met Mary I knew uh, I had more regular contact with all of them but as soon as I met Mary all contact uh, with the majority of them ceased or, or went to this once a year thing that many of them do yeah. Why do you reckon that might be? Well, you see, you see, while Jesus, the guy who's saying he's Jesus, the crazy nutter who's saying he's Jesus, just says he's Jesus, then, you know, you can flirt with the idea, right? But when you've got Mary independently having memories of her own and independently knowing who she is and independently confirming the identities of other people who she knows to be of the 14, now it's getting a bit more real, right? And the more real it becomes, the more confronting it becomes. Isn't that true? Yeah. Isn't that what, what happens in your own life? Right? You know, you could ignore the fact that your husband and wife might be, not be working too good, you know, for a long period of time. But when does it become real? When he goes off and cheats or, you know, when some kind of confront, confrontational thing occurs, then you see the reality. And that's what happens for them too, you know. But the more of the 14 who engage their life as one of the 14, the the more of them that do it, the more the others are going to feel confronted through the process. 
Uh, I think the last time I heard John was in the sixth or seventh sphere. Seventh, so yeah. So he's still in the seventh? Yep. yep. And uh, I think at that time there was a struggle because you guys couldn't remember how to get into the eighth sphere or some sort of thing you yep. were trying to remember? Yeah, I've worked out how. <laughs> Good on you. <ya. laughs> yeah, but I have to do it now. Yeah. So that's the emotional process. That's pretty hard. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks for everything you're doing. Hey? Yeah, nice. Our pleasure. Yeah, so John's worked out how too, and he's got to do it emotionally too. Does that make sense? So by, both of us, who, who does it first? Nobody, none of us really care, but we've got to both do it. Um, and that's the struggle we're having at the moment. Yeah. Nina. You mentioned um, somewhere along the line that waves of love from God were going to be increasing. Yeah, haven't you felt them? I'm <laughs> wonder, wondering if the recent discovery of gravitational waves has anything to do with that. Uh, don't confuse a physical, a physical scientific reality with, with love. Because, uh, you know, that love is a scientific reality, of course, but it's, in, in a, it's a different dimensional reality. And what I mean by that is the gravitational forces apply both in the... In the uh, physical and spiritual realms you understand but they don't apply in the soul realm so gravitational forces while they affect your physical body and your spiritual body they do not affect your soul you follow Do you, does everyone understand that it's, it's, it makes sense logically doesn't it a physical a physical force right cannot affect your soul it has to be a soul-based force that affects your soul. It can't be a physical or a metaphysical force that affects your soul. It can affect your soul through a byproduct of, it, of its effect only. So in other words, if I go out and jump off a building and hurt my legs, then I'll probably feel pretty sore and maybe cry. Well, that's affecting my soul, but only through a byproduct of me breaking the law of gravity. The gravi gravity itself doesn't affect my soul. It affects my bodies. My spirit and physical bodies. So there was also a mention of truth and love ha having substance and being different in that in their nature somewhere in the channelings that truth was a different substance to love was what was mentioned. Uh, yes, but they're very, very uh, closely associated with each other. Truth can't exist without love, and li and love can't exist without truth either. So th this is one of the questions I'm going to ask you later in the group. How many of you have openly published all of your financial details to, every, to, to the world? Like many of you have Facebook pages and... Yeah. How many of you have Facebook pages? I'd say a good half or more of the group. How many of you on that Facebook page have put your personal financial information So I'm the only person living in truth. Why do I do it? Because it's loving. Why don't you do it? Because you haven't considered it that it's loving. You're not being transparent. You don't believe in transparency. Not believing in transparency is not believing in truth. Transparency is loving. Follow. So, you, so, what, so there is a relationship, a direct relationship between truth and love. Right? And when you're not being truthful and you're not being open and transparent, you're also not being loving. What, com what comes up for me there is... Um Why should you have to? Well, <laughs> is the world really interested in my stuff? No, see, there's your excuse. There's your excuse. I've been modelling to you this behaviour for how many years? Uh, five or six, Five I think. or six years, yeah. yes. Yeah. And none of you have engaged it. No, I haven't told you to engage it, because I'm not going to tell you. Because if you really loved, you would already have engaged it. Do you follow? You would already be doing it. 
in the end, we want the entire world financially to be completely open about all of what's happening financially to the entire world. Then we know where every single dollar's going. We know what every single, every single thing's being spent on. We know why. We know what's going to happen. We know what we should be producing, what we shouldn't be producing. We would know everything we need to know about how to look after the economic situation of the world, would we not? If all of us did this, if all the companies did it and all of the individuals did it, then we would know, right? But, but the companies don't do it for the same reason you don't do it. <laughs> Why? Because there's justifications, there's excuses, there's oh, people are not interested. Then there's also the thing of, oh, but, you know, I don't want them to know that I spent 50 bucks, you know, going down the pub last week. You know, I don't, I don't want them to know that I've spent, you know, $200 on a hooker two weeks ago or anything like that, right? I don't want anybody to know where my money goes. I want privacy. You know, there's, a, there's this huge thing about privacy, isn't there? Uh, I'm not very concerned about privacy. Not on that level. So there's actually a difference between stating the facts of your life as opposed to wanting to indulge some or wanting, you know, that whole thing of people to feel wanting, with you and all... all wanting to indulge in addiction is yeah. different than, in, than in actually exposing the facts. The fact. yep. Yes. Many of you are on Facebook because you're indulging in addiction. What's the addictions? Well, you can answer. You're on Facebook, aren't you? Lee? I'm on Facebook. Yeah, so, what's the addiction? Um, well, you get likes. <laughs> and what's a what, like? And, and that's what I was saying before. I've got this big emotion, you know, this big terror that I don't even have to be afraid of being physically harmed. Just not being liked is enough to scare me. Yeah, there's there's so many reasons why people use Facebook that that are completely addictive. And uh, that's why Mary and I don't have Facebook accounts, because we just feel the whole the whole Facebook thing is all addictive. It was all addiction. There's a lot of facade. Yeah. Well, it's both, but yeah, but driven by addiction. Yeah, our facade is driven by addiction. So, yeah, and and it's a, it, it it's stopping stopping a lot of truthfulness. But you could use it as a tool for truthfulness. But see how many likes you get and. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I mean, I do post stuff that I think is relevant about what's going on and those... Mm, but it's only the stuff that you feel generally the public will is, accept. Is going to be or, relatively safe. Or your public will accept, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. The friends and so forth. Yeah. You don't want to share or everything about your life. And, and to me, you don't have to share everything about your life, but fa Facebook, because the reality is, your life is your life, live it. But Facebook's preventing you from living it. Because you're waiting for approval, you want acceptance, you want to tell people what's going on. And the tweeting thing's the same thing, isn't it? Like, I tweet this and tweet that and tell everybody what's happening with me every single moment of the day. Why do I do this? And oh, I've got 500,000 tweet followers. Isn't this fantastic? And what does that tell me about my value and my worth? There's a whole heap of addictions in that. You, you, we need to be learn, learning to engage our will without needing anybody's approval or acceptance or agreement. We need to engage the truth with the same thing, with the same passion, without needing anybody's acceptance or agreement. Yeah, and then there's a lot more depth. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of questions I'll ask you about the, your resistance to truth, because it, there is a lot of resistance to truth still. And you cannot progress. Remember the channeling that you heard yeah, the, the one from Sonia. You remember that? She, she said how important truth was to, to you receiving love. But it's an essential ingredient. You can't receive love without truth. And yet most of you are still hooked into the Facebook religion, right? And the religion, what I'm talking about there, is a desire to withhold truth for public consumption you, you withhold it or share it depending upon how other people will respond and and you need to learn get to the stage where you don't 
It, it makes no difference how people are going to respond. You will do it because it's the right thing to do. It's the loving thing to do. So we go Barbara and then Elvira. <coughs> At the last assistant groups, both of those topics came up, Facebook mm -hmm. and um, disclosing your financial details. So mm -hmm. when I got back, I contemplated both of them because I don't do Facebook and I don't do personal mm -hmm. emails and all of those things. Because mm -hmm. um, I then looked at valuing my time. How do I spend my time? And, and so I made a choice that, well, I definitely... So if I'm going to disclose my financials, if I don't do it on Facebook, how do I do it? So then I'd have to create something else and that was going into my time. And can, you see, can you see in the end there, sh there should be some kind of site you could go to where any single person yeah. could just openly disclose their stuff on their site and, and, and help everybody in the world just be transparent. See, there's a good opportunity for one of you <laughs> to develop such a site. But see, we're that all waiting. That's my problem. Yeah, but we're all waiting for someone else to do it, right? Why we do that for? Because we don't want to be the first one that does it, and we don't want to fail, and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to have a whole heap of things emotionally happen to us. So, so we don't do it, and so we say there's nowhere to put it. Yes, and I was just wondering whether I was using that as a justification. Of and course, it's an excuse. And valuing my time and all of those things. They just were all excuses. Yeah, I've made an effort of making a website. I make a PDF for everything. I get an accountant to look at the accounts and do a P PDF for everything. And I do all of that for you. <laughs> I don't need it. I know where I am. <laughs> all right. I'm doing that to demonstrate to you the need for transparency. You see? The need for truthful transparency in your day-to-day -day life. But it's a, it, honestly, it's freedom. Yeah. Like anybody, anybody says to me, "Oh, but you, how much do you earn a year?" I, have a look at the internet; it's all there. And and there's a difference between earn and actually, like I, I don't feel I earn anything. <laughs> but but what we receive in donations and what we do with those donations are all there. If I, so. So I don't see any reason why everybody can't live the same way. So, so on that, that's what I was contemplating after the last group. So do I then have to create a website for myself to be able to do that on? Like what? Well, I have. And, but your website has far more valuable stuff on it than that. Yeah, but see, you're, again, you're judging the value. Like the value of it is that, is that if another person in the world sharing and being openly transparent she's telling the world the reason why she's doing it is she wants to, she wants the world to be transparent and she wants all the politicians to be transparent she wants all the businesses to be transparent and then she realized that ah oh, she doesn't want herself to be transparent so what she decided to do was to put be transparent with her life in the hope that all of those businesses and all of those politicians and all those governments and all of those you know, organisations and all of those places that she wants to be transparent will follow her example. You think about it, most of you are waiting for someone else to do it. You want other people to be transparent with you, but you don't want to be transparent with them first. Because the problem with doing it first is you're the one that gets all the crap. You're the one that gets attacked. You're the one that gets criticised. You're the one. That's why you don't want to do it first. You want somebody else to do it first. Do it, get them to do all the hard yards, and then and then when everybody else accepts that, you go, I'll do it then. Is the world going to change this way? No. You all say you want the world to change, but you know what you're doing. You're waiting for the world to change. So this one exercise is just demonstrating that we do that with everything else then? Yeah. As well. Yeah. There's a song, isn't there, that goes, yeah, I'll play it. I'll play it the next few days. Waiting. It's tomorrow, actually. I think it's on our thing. Waiting for the world to change. John Mayer. That's what most of us are doing. We're, we're waiting for somebody else to do what we think should be done and we don't want to do it first. And the reasons why we don't want to do it first are all emotional, which we are unwilling to address.
we don't want to address those emotions. Yeah. So uh, we had a Vera next. She was, if she can even remember what she <laughs> could ask. Five more minutes and then I'm finishing. I've used Facebook very addictively, very much in facade, but it's also brought me many huge, huge challenges. Mm -hmm. So, the law of attraction works perfectly, right? Yeah. Like so, the, so, so many of you are engaging facade in uh, your Facebook in order to uh, try to allay your fears and to make certain things not happen and to so forth. But of course, your law, of, the attractions are still going to occur. So you're going to I'm get being attacked a lot because I say what I think. Exactly. You're going to start. Oh. And what? Why? Why do you get attacked for saying what you think? Because you're afraid of getting attacked for saying what you think. Yeah. And you don't want to work through that fear. Yeah. The other question was before you said, um, you know, Nina asked about God's waves of love. And you said, haven't you felt them or I haven't felt them? So no, the reason why I asked that question is because I don't feel any of you have. Can I ask you like how, how that has manifested for you, how it's felt for you? Yeah. I, uh, there are changes happening constantly in my and Mary's life. Every single day is different. Every single day we grow. Every single day we change. Physically, emotionally, every single day we're changing. Does that make sense? If we, that's, an, that's a demonstration of love being expressed in your life. Right? And a love affecting your life. But you've got to allow love in. So you got, this is why we need to have tomorrow's discussion. Most of you don't want to let love in. You want to let addiction in. You want to have the addiction-based things. And addiction is not love. And you're, you're desperate for love, and yet really you're not desperate for love, you're desperate for addiction. So, you, so, what, you're, so what you're saying is that God's sending more waves of love, and because you're open to it... Yeah, all, all of you have the capacity to be open to it. Yeah, but you're more open to it. Yep. So it's manifesting as cha change, change daily in your life. Yeah. Change is impossible. One of the things you'll learn tomorrow is change is impossible without having someone in a higher condition help drive that change for you. So who's in a higher condition than all of us? <laughs> God, so it makes sense that any time I connect with God, it's going to drive some change in my life, right? Doesn't it? Yeah. But what, what do most of you want? Most of you don't want change. You want comfort. You want your life to remain as it is, right? Because you, you feel, many of you feel that it's as good as it's going to get. That this is a faith issue, which is something we'll discuss Thursday. Uh, so many of the things that we're going to discuss you'll find actually will fit in practically into your life right now. And that's what we're hoping to achieve over the group, is to demonstrate the relationship between the practical things that we need to discuss with you and what effect that is having in your life right now, t today, and what, why change isn't occurring much more rapidly. You can embrace much more rapid change, but fear is a primary impediment to you doing that. Your desire, your lack of desire for truth is a primary impediment for doing that. Your lack of desire to process through emotion is, a lack, is an impediment to that. Right? Your lack of desire to take action in your life is an impediment to your growth. You need to see these things as impediments and not safeties. Most of you see them as safeties, you see, something that makes you feel safe and secure. From God's perspective, you're very unsafe and very insecure because you're not engaging the very basics of God's principles of love and truth. Right? And that's what we would like to help you over the next week to, to adjust your will so that you don't do that anymore, so that you instead start focusing your passions and desires, your, your, your life, on true growth, no matter what happens. And many of you think it's going to be a terrible cost. 
and hardly any of you believe there's going to be wonderful rewards. Right? So many of you believe it's going to be really hard and terrible and there's going to be so many costs and you lose friends and you lose family and all these different terrible things will happen and you're not seeing the potential benefits of all the things that will happen. My life is tremendously much more, it's much better now than it ever was. And yet most of the world thinks I'm an idiot who's crazy. And yet my life's a lot better than it was. So you, many of you don't believe that, that it's going to get better. You only believe that if you engage this process, it's just going to get worse. And that's a faith issue. So that's another thing we need to discuss this week, how a lack of faith influences your will. So you can see how there's a lot of things we're going to talk about this week that, that will, have an, it will have an impact on your life if you let it. But, but it's going to get down to whether you let it, whether you desire this change or not. God's, like I said, God's doing everything God possibly can to help you through this change. But it just depends a lot on you. So that's what we would like to encourage you to do this week is to examine w whether you really want to or not. Because it's no good torturing yourself with something you don't really want to do. <laughs> do you understand what I mean by that? So a lot of people who hear divine truth, they get so worried and concerned. It's, oh, it's terrible. It's, well, I'm worried about what's going to happen in my future life now. I'm worried about what's going to happen in the spirit world. I'm worried about what's going to happen when I die. And I'm more worried about it. Well, I'm more worried now than I ever was before. <laughs> Many of you feel that way, right? More concerned now than ever before. And, and you don't, there's no need to be more concerned. How you were before is worse than how you were now. So things are better for you now. <laughs> than how they were do you see so so why are we so concerned it's because we're driven by this terror aren't we and fear rather than actually being driven by the desire to love or by desire to just live in harmony with truth and see what the results will be and to trust that that if we do things god's way in harmony with god's laws that that our, our own life will work out better not only our own life uh, also the lives of every person who we influence will work out better too and for many of us in the western world we influence a large number of people through our purchases and through what we do in our day to day life we influence the people all over the world without our even being aware and the more aware we become of that the, the more loving and truthful we become in those interactions we, we don't know what the result's going to be if we did it that way. But we, we don't even want to know, <laughs> unfortunately, because we're so frightened that we, we don't even want to know. So what we do instead is we sit and listen to hundreds of hours of this crackpot telling you about things, right, that you're fascinated about, let's face it, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right, but you don't engage, in your day-to-day -day life. Now, does that make any sense? You're fascinated by it. You, you, you think, wow, this is amazing stuff. This is good stuff. You know, this is stuff I need to imply in my life. But you don't actually do it. Why is that? That tells you that there's a lot of fear present, preventing these positive actions upon the information you learn. So many of you have listened for years, right? I've known many of you for, some of you have known longer than I've known Mary, like in this life. And I've been with her for eight years. And yet in that time I've not seen you change. So that, t that tells me how frightened you are. But you're using fear as an excuse, right? Fear is an excuse. Worried about what other people think of you, how you might be attacked, how it might look. That's all excuse. At the end, you've got to at some point choose what you want for yourself. And that's why we're having this week. We want to help you develop your will to the degree where you make choices. Right? 
And some of you may make the choice, I never want to hear divine truth again, and that's okay with me. At least you've had the opportunity to hear it. It's terrible for you to keep hearing it without acting, without changing. Because all you're going to do is have a mountain of stuff that you know you're going to have to address at some point. So you, the trouble is you're now conscious of all this stuff you've got to address without having a desire to address it. And that's a terribly tortuous situation, as many of you have probably personally experienced now. Right? It is far better to either say, I'm going to ignore it completely, or the best is I'm going to do it rather than just talk about it or listen about it. I'm going to do it. It's far better to do that. It's far better to make positive decisions and act upon them than it is just to talk about them. And I know many of you would like to see the world change, right? Many of you, I feel, have a sincere desire to see the world change. But many of you are not changing. So I don't see how you can expect others to change when you yourself don't want to change. You know, that's not very fair to expect somebody else to do something you're not willing to do yourself. Right? And you know, you've heard all that new age stuff about, you know, you've got to be the change you want to see in the world and all those kind of things, which have truisms, you know, what I'd call truisms, are things that are partially true. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty, the, the real facts of things, we generally do not apply to ourselves what we want other people to apply to themselves. And this is a terrible problem we have as humanity that we need to correct. So this week, some good opportunities to correct some of these things. Huh? Yeah. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about these things tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so get a good night's sleep. You're going to need it. And... Uh, and and be ready for a nice, uh, it'll be 10.30 start in the morning. Yes, uh, look, uh, the, the uh, name, tags. name tags are very helpful for me because I haven't got Mary's memory of who everyone is. <laughs> but also it's very easy because um, I can say Denise and whoever's the mic runner can see Denise sort of thing and, and see the name as well. So it's going to be very handy um, throughout the group and also it's a great way for you guys to interact and you know each other. So if you could wear those tags while, while you, at least while you're here during the day, that'd be fantastic. You don't need to wear them down the street or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> that's, that's up to you. <laughs> Sorry? 31 hours. It was an hour and 38 minutes. Yep. But from tomorrow onwards, you're going to find me pretty strict on the time because there is a lot to cover. Yeah. And I want to cover it. Pamela? Would it help you if to extend the breaks a bit if you had a bit of a longer break? No. <laughs> no, does it help you? No. <laughs> No, we've, we've designed, we've been very careful designing the program, to be honest, um, about what we thought we could handle. Of course, that was two of us speaking rather than one, but, but I, I feel quite confident that to uh, be able to handle the process. It's just the, the key thing is that, is that more resistance you have, the harder it's going to get for me. All right, so, so that, that's something for you guys to consider. The, the more resistance you have, the harder it is for, for the presenter. They've got to work over your resistance, work through your resistance. Also, remember, the more resistance you have, the more spirits come who also have resistance. So that adds to the intensity of the resistance. So you, you, you can just feel in the last half an hour, when I start raising some real issues with you guys, and, you, and you're in some self-contemplation, but also in some self-judgment, that's when it gets a bit heavier, right? Heavier feeling. Straight away it comes over the audience. That's you not wanting to feel. That's attracting spirits who, who just say, yeah, we're going to get heavy now with you guys. Now, that's not what our celestial friends want. 
they, what they would like you to just feel, you know, about what's being said. Contemplate it, reflect upon it. Don't punish yourself for it. Reflect upon the reasons why you've chosen to do certain things you've done in the last whatever years, right? rather than punishing yourself for them. Right? So I'm going to remind you of that whenever you feel a heavy feeling take over the room. Um, I'm going to remind you that, yep, you're causing this. <laughs> and allow yourself to feel why you're causing this as a group. We, we, want this, we want the celestial spirits to be able to help you. We want the dark spirits to just stay away from you. But they're not going to do that if you get into these st states of resistance and also shut down emotionally. So, so we, we don't want that to occur. All right? So we'll try to help you through that, but we can't do everything. It's you. You remember, you're the most important person in your progress. Mm. Okay, well, let's have a... Go home and sleep. See you later, guys. Thanks for that feedback.